9, 179, Such Love. That God should love a sinner such as I should yearn to change my sorrow into bliss, nor rest till he hath planned to bring me nigh. How wonderful is love like this, such love, such wondrous love, such love, such wondrous love, that God should love a sinner such as I. How wonderful is love like this, that Christ should join so freely in the scheme, although on Calvary did ever human come find nobler theme than love divine that ransomed me. Such love, such wondrous love, such love, that's wondrous love that God should love a sinner such as I. How wonderful his love like this, that for a willful outcast such as I, the Father bled, the Savior bled and died, redemption for a worthless slave to buy, who long in law and grace defiled. Such love, such wondrous love, such love, such wondrous love, that God should love a sinner such as I. How wonderful his love like this. And now he takes me to his heart of son. He asked me not to fill a servant's place. The far off country wanderings all are done. Wide open are his arms of grace. Such love, such wondrous love, such love, such wondrous love that God should love a sinner such as I. How wonderful his love like this. Number 240. 240, the lily of the valley. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The lily in him alone I see all I need to cleanse and make me fully whole in sorrow he's my comfort in trouble he's my stay he tells me every care on him to roll he's a lily of the valley the bright and morning star he's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul he all my griefs has taken and all my sorrows borne. In temptation he's my strong and mighty tower. I am all for him forsaken and all my idols torn. From my heart and now he keeps me by his side. Oh, all the world forsake me and Satan tempt me sore. I shall safely reach the goal. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here, while I live by faith in you, his blessed will. A wall of fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. With his manna, he my hungry soul shall fill. 
Then sweeping up to glory to see his blessed face, where rivers of delight shall ever roll. He's a lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Take our Bibles now for our memory verse. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13. And let's repeat our verse four times. Let's begin. 1 John chapter 5 verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Thank you. And let's look to the Lord, shall we? And Father, tonight as we pause before you and acknowledge you I think of creation we think about a park called Yellowstone and we think about a name of a place called Old Faithful faithfully every day that water spews up Faithful is he that had called you. Lord, you're faithful. And Lord, you said, even if we are not faithful, you abide faithful. And Lord, I want to just acknowledge tonight these here with the exception of some not well or working. They're your faithful ones. They're the ones that when you send your son for us, we'll hear those faithful words, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter in the joy of thy Lord. Lord, how we want to hear that. Sometimes people take that word lightly but Lord, I praise you and I thank you for the faithful family at Emmanuel. Thank you that you're so faithful to us. And Lord, any time of the day, we can call upon you. I pray tonight now as we once again look into your word that you will give us some practical truths about the new birth. Maybe all elementary to some, and yet repetition is the greatest teacher. Lord, we pray for this week and what you have for us. We pray, Lord, for Eliza as she gets ready to pack up and make her way south and go to university. Lord, there's 
all kind of things that can befall her there. So Lord, we pray that you'll watch over her and keep her safe and Lord, that there will be a church that she can fellowship with. And then for each of us, what you have for us this week, may we walk off knowing that you are faithful and always there for us. Bless now the preaching of your word, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. John chapter 3 once again. We looked at the doctrinal truth of the new birth, the subject of regeneration, better known as the new birth or born again. So as we read these verses again this evening from John chapter 3, We'll see and we'll look in a moment about Nicodemus and the Apostle Paul and their testimony. And then we'll look at baptismal regeneration that's possibly alluded to in verse 5. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, the same came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit is spirit, Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou heareth the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can this thing be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel? Not just a teacher, but a master. And knoweth not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. If I've told you earthly things, and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And no man hath ascended to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Goodness gracious. Don't you think that perplexed Nicodemus? How can you be here and there at the same time? And then he gives the illustration from Numbers 21 and the Israelites wilderness journey and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness even so must the son of man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, 
But he that believeth not is condemned already. Boy, if we could get our hearts and minds around that statement. Condemned already. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So looking at the new birth from a practical standpoint, we saw, if you'll find the book of Ephesians 2, we saw that Peter would say that we're partakers of a divine nature. Think about that. Divine nature. We have a new nature. Not the old, refashioned, reconstructed, but something very, very new. Paul writes to the people at Ephesus, verse 1 of chapter 2, And you, you, hath he quickened, that's regeneration, who were dead and trespasses and sins, verse 5, even when we were dead in sins, but we think about the love of God, had quickened us together with Christ by grace are you saved. It's a spiritual quickening. And then it's a new creation. Look further in chapter 2. Familiar verses for sure. Verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourself, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. What shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? So you can't buy it. You can't win it. But when we're born again, there's a change and our character should be, a change in our conduct, a change in our cause. We have a new cause. David said, is there not a cause? And all those Israelites that were cowering over the giant got into the battle because David said, is there not a cause? For we are his workmanship. I love this verse. God putting us together a new on the inside, created in Christ Jesus unto good works that God did, God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Second Corinthians chapter five. I don't believe that a twice born child of God is gonna to continue to go to the bar I don't believe they're going to continue to go to the liquor store. I don't believe they're going to continue to go to the casino. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. Because something has changed on the inside. For the love of Christ, this is what's changed, constrains us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Dead in trespasses and sins. And that he died for all. That they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. That's a tall order to be changed, to be transformed, to daily be conformed in the image of Christ. But unto him which died for them and rose again. He died, he died, he died, but he rose again. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh, yet though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Why? He has his glorified body. 
And then in summation, Paul says, therefore, if any man, boy or girl, in Christ, in Christ, what a nice place to be, in Christ. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, in Adam all die, in Christ all are made new. So God places us into the family by the Holy Spirit that regenerates us. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he, she, they are new creatures, a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. What becomes new? And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us, <laughs> think about this, the ministry of reconciliation. Paul, who was a murderer, Paul, who hated Jesus, Paul, who hated Christianity, was transformed on the Damascus Road that faithful afternoon and became a reconciler left Judaism, left the prowess, left the privilege, and became born again. Verse 19. To wit, or to know, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we, we who have the new nature, are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. For God hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And then we have a new life. Colossians 3. A new life <laughs> that comes about by the new nature. Question to the people at Colossians. If ye then be risen with Christ. Paul said to the people at Ephesus that we sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. To the people at Colossians, he says, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, intercessing on our behalf, interceding on our behalf, praying on our behalf, Oh, that they would follow me. Oh, that they would be faithful to me. Oh, that they would listen to me. Heavenly Father, oh, that they would not allow Satan to sift them to the point where he did Peter. And he did sift Peter, didn't he? Simon, Simon, Luke 22. Satan had desired to sift thee as wheat, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, but it did. But it did. And when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. Well, Peter was converted on the day of Pentecost and was a changed man. No longer a coward, but now consecrated and dedicated to his Lord. Set your affections on things above. Get off this world. Quit looking to the things of the world. That's hard to do, especially for young people starting out. What shall I do? How shall I do it? Where shall I go? Whom shall I fellowship with? I'm concerned and careful about our dear young lady going off to school. Two have already gone off to school in the States. And though a Christian school, yet in Christian schools, things happen. In churches, things happen. 
So when you're dedicated and Christ is your first love, then all the other temptations that come your way, if Christ is first, you'll be able to be bold and to stand because your affections are on him. When you love someone, you think about them all the time. When they come around and you love them, there's a, something goes on in your belly. Something's going on in my belly. I wish it'd get fixed, but anyway. <laughs> there, there, there's a tingling like, and uh, you, you think about them constantly. And uh, it's like, uh, well, you hang up first. No, you hang up. No, no, you hang up. No, no, you hang up. Well, I'll walk you home. Okay, but now I'm going to walk you home. Well, then I'm going to walk you home. It kind of, it's a circle, isn't it? But not a vicious circle. It's a loving circle. And that should be our relationship to Christ. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead. You see, you can't harm a dead person. And daily you must, we must, be dead to self. Because through the course of a day, moment by moment by moment, temptations come our way. Things come into our minds. Wicked things, nasty things. And if you develop it, you're going to get in trouble. So the moment it comes in, you have to cast it down. Paul said, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imagination and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of Christ and bringing in every thought to the captivity of Christ. Lord, what about that? Shall I think about that? Shall I dwell about that? Shall I pick that scab over and over of bitterness? Shall I continue to pick it? That person whom I've forgiven and yet Satan brings it up again. How could you forgive her? How could you forgive him? Don't you deserve your pound of flesh? But when those thoughts come to our minds with many other, you have to cast it down and yield to the Lord. For ye are dead. Paul said, I die daily. I die daily. And your life is hid with Christ in God, Satan can't get at it. He can poke at you, but you have the choice to open the door. Back during the Chinese and Japanese war, the Japanese had tanks, Chinese did not. And the Chinese snipers would shoot at the tanks, ping, ping, ping. They couldn't hurt the tanks, but they would get the people inside the tank so infuriated that they'd pop up their head and they'd get them. So Satan gets to you with a ping, 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 ping. And when you open up the door, a floodgate comes in. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear. He's coming. Shall appear. Then shall ye also appear with him in glory. I just love that. Now, we're part of the family. John chapter 14. Part of the family. There's a now a family unit. And by the way, that's why we have the church house. A family unit. People can choose to be or not to be. Come or not come. Be a part, not be a part. That's their choice. So we're in Christ. John 14, verse 20 and verse 23. We're in Christ. Christ is in us. Hard to just take a verse in its context, so let's read the context. Verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another powerhouse. Another powerhouse. The paraclete. The one who will come alongside. That he may abide with you forever. Who is he? The spirit of truth. 
whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not. Remember, God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. <clears throat> Jesus said, The wind bloweth where it listeth, thou heareth the sound thereof, but canst not tell from whence it cometh the word go. So is the spirit of God. So, when we think about this then, the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, but they see you, and they see me, and that's the convicting choice. Because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. And now he's in us, of course, because the new nature, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. He lives in us. And I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. How will he do that? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day, ye shall know that I am in the Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Verse 23. Well, Judas, not Iscariot. Judas saith to him, not Iscariot. Lord, how is it that thou will manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Remember, they're ignorant now. They don't have the Holy Spirit, so they're still asking foolish questions. Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him. <coughs> Excuse me. We will come to him and make our abode with him. And then, of course, John chapter 6. John 6, the bread chapter. <coughs> and he sure had a play on words with the Jews. They were going crazy. What do you mean we're going to drink your flesh, drink your blood, and eat your flesh? What are you talking about? The more they didn't listen, the more they didn't heed, he made it more difficult. <clears throat> he said, I'm the bread of life. Verse 48. <clears throat> Verse 56. <clears throat> he that eateth my flesh, oh, there you have it, Catholicism. Yes, body of Christ. Body of Christ, they have their communion. They take that wafer, that host, and the poor, innocent, however duped people, stick out their tongue, and the priest sticks in a host. And that's cannibalism, that they're going to eat the body of Christ. He's doing that to these Jews because they're refusing to listen to simplicity, so he makes it more difficult for them. Verse 55, he says, For my meat, my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna, and are dead. He that eateth this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Now watch this. Many therefore disciples, when they heard this, said, Goodness gracious. How, what is he talking about? This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, does this offend you? Remember I said this morning, there are things that offend God's people. Great peace have led that love thy law, nothing shall offend them. What and if I shall, ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? Now here is the point. It is the Spirit, verse 63, that quickeneth the flesh profiteth nothing. So, by faith, you partake of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is the living word, he's the living water, 
He's the light. He's the living bread. And then, of course, Christ in us, we in him. And then back to our text. Back to our text. So there's the kingdom within, Matthew 13, and there's the kingdom without. So when you get saved, you're part of the kingdom. John 3, verse 3 and 5, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, verse 5, I say unto thee, Except a man is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Is that talking about water baptism? Stay tuned. Now, we become part of the family. We share that this morning with you again. John chapter 1. Part of the family. I'm part of the family. He came to his own, verse 11. His own received him not. The Jews said, no, we don't want this man to reign over us. Let his blood be upon our head, on our children's head. And for 2,000 years, the Jews have been a nomad. Still a nomad. They don't have their land. Well, did Trump give them their land? No, he divided it. He divided it to the Palestinians. It's their land from Genesis 12. God promised the land, the name, but now they've been set aside until the fullness, Romans 11, 25, blindness in part, some Jews get saved, thank the Lord. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. When that last Gentile is saved, wow, we're gone. Gone. Hope it comes before my next car payment, someone said. <laughs> Hope it comes before I lose my mortgage, someone said. Hope he comes before I get married, nobody said. <laughs> Verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man. That's your birth to your family. That's your works. That's your church membership, your religion, but of God. Now, the new birth is not reformation. Look again in chapter 3. Nicodemus had religion. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know. Who, who knows? We the Sanhedrin. We the high power. We the authority. We know that thou art our teacher. We've heard about you. I've heard about you. And it stressed me. And I wanted to come and have a talk with you. Don't you like that old song? Just a little talk with Jesus. <laughs> and I wanted to talk with you. I, I don't understand what's happening here. But all my fellow Sanhedrins want you dead. I don't understand why they want you dead. You are talking about your father. You're talking about heaven. We, we, I'm, I'm perplexed. Explain it to me. For no man can do these miracles, raise the dead, cause the blind to see, heal the lepers, cause the dumb to hear, the deaf to speak, think about that. The blind to see. Even the man in John 9 says, uh, have, do devils give sight? 
Mm-mm. I mean, we've never experienced that unless you're having eye issues. But to be blind and then to see. To not being able to hear and then to hear. To not being able to speak and then to speak. And you get the idea. We know, but we don't understand. So how can this happen except God be with you? But now, wait a minute. What about Moses? I'm confused. Jesus said you got to be born again. You have religion. You have power. You have prowess. You're a member of the Sanhedrin. But you're lost, Nicodemus. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, verse 9, How can these things be? Aren't you a master? Don't you know the Bible? Don't you know your Jewish book? The Torah? Don't you understand that? Moses talked about me, spoke about me. You don't understand? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, verse 11, we speak that we do know. You must take the unknown and bring it to the known in witnessing to others. And then how can we forget our brother Paul? So to be sure, Nicodemus had some prowess and some position. But how about the little rabbi, Paul? Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Paul was a very special fellow. A lost Jew, but he got saved. And man, he got saved. Now he lays out his pedigree. He lays out his credentials. And man, he had some credentials. Verse 2, he talks about dogs. That's not the barking dogs. That's false teachers. Beware of dogs. Beware of the concision, circumcision. For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. No confidence. Confidence in the flesh. Look back to Romans 7 momentarily. No confidence in the flesh. None whatsoever. Verse 14, for we know that the law is what? But I am what? Sold under sin. Look at verse 18. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. I have a problem with my flesh. Pretty outstanding testimony. His credentials back to Philippians 3. Verse 4. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, not contradicting himself, but now he's just going to talk about his pedigree, his background, his credentials, if you were. If any man thinketh that, it, thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I am more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel. Fully Jew. Not a half-breed. Totally Jew. Not only that, the tribe of Benjamin. The first king came from the tribe of Benjamin. Joseph gave Benjamin more than his other brothers. 
the Hebrew of the Hebrew as touching the law, a Pharisee, a son of a Pharisee, and now a Sanhedrin with credentials to go to Damascus and bring back some of those Christians. Concerning zeal, I'm killing Christians. I'm persecuting the church, touching the righteous, which is of the law, blameless. Man, those are some heavy credentials. But now notice verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are becoming new. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency. Wow. Wish we could get this. The excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered, third time you read it, the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Jeremiah, what do you have to say about that? Jeremiah chapter 9, please. Jeremiah, what do you have to say about this matter of knowing the Lord? Jeremiah, you can't get married. You're not going to get married, Jeremiah. Ezekiel, you get to get married, but your wife is going to die. I'm taking your wife from you. You're not going to mourn or weep, but you're going to get out and preach for me. But Jeremiah, you can't get married because of the corruption and destruction that are coming to my people. 70 years captivity in Babylon. Jeremiah, I'm going to spare you. <clears throat> Jeremiah 9. I love this. Two verses. 23. Thus saith Jehovah, the Lord, Jehovah, all caps. That's Jehovah, the self-existing one who reveals himself, who is all-powerful, who has protection, provisions, purpose for your life, if you let him. Let not the wise men glory in his wisdom. Think about that. And find 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Don't lose Hebrews, or uh, James, or uh, a little bit of <laughs> Jeremiah. <laughs> but think about this. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. See how many times you find that word foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the dynamite explosion that took place on the inside. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the didymus, it is the dynamite, it is the power of God unto salvation. The power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, Isaiah 29, 14 is where that's quoted from. And will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where are the wise? Where are the Plato's, the Socrates? Where are the wise men? Where are the scribes? Where are the disputers of this world? Those who like to debate. It touches my heart, troubles my heart. That are some of our young people that have gone off into schools have become debaters. 
Well, I'm a part of the bait class. Shame on you. They're teaching you to go against authority and to go against power. You're going to debate God? You're going to go against God and the Bible and listen to all that foolishness? And yet they get sucked in, drawn in. I'm so angry at the two-year absent of our church. Two long years. We're invited for lunch this afternoon. Sitting in a restaurant and here came a man with a mask on and plastic gloves. Don't your heart go out to something like that? People who are still duped. Yes, people have gotten sick. Yes, people have died. But the saddest thing of all, the saddest thing of all, is God's people have floundered and fallen away from the things of God. They've sure enough fallen away and have become duped by the world and the flesh and the devil and I don't know that they'll ever come back and it troubles me. Verse 21. First Corinthians 1. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign. Give us a sign. Give us a sign. Give us a sign. Jesus said no sign. Or, I'll give you a sign. How about Jonah and the whale? Did Jonah die? Well, if he's a type of Christ, he died. Greeks seek after wisdom. Acts 17 will tell you all about that. We preach Christ crucified under the Jews. Is talking about what do we care about this Christ? Who cares about this Jesus? We have Moses. We're learning about that in the book of Hebrews. And under the Greeks, foolishness. If you're counting, that's three times. But unto them that are called, both Jew and and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. I want to know more about God. Psalms 119, verse 99 says, I'm wiser than my teacher. Why? I've got the book. I have the Bible. I know how, how it all came about. By the way, I know how it's going to end. The world will never end, but the age that we're living in is rapidly coming to a close. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, verse 25. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God had chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring in naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are you, see it, in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Now let's go back to our text, Jeremiah 9. And that's what Paul is quoting here in 1 Corinthians 1. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. Hey, hey, hey. What does Elon have to say? 
Who cares what Elon has to say? What does Jesus have to say? What does the rich people have to say? No, what does Jesus have to say? The audacity of these ignoramuses and foolish people. They're lost. I understand that. But who would look to them for wisdom because they have money? The book of Ecclesiastes said a poor man delivered the city. But no one looked to him because he was a poor man. So because someone has money, we look to them and bow down to them? Because someone is an actor or an actress, we bow down to them? Because someone can kick a ball, throw a ball, take a stick and hit a, a, a rubber puck into a net? Ooh. But let him that glorieth, here it is, my beloved. But let him that glorieth, glory in this. What, Jeremiah? What is the Lord saying to you? That he understandeth and knoweth me. That I am Jehovah, which exerciseth loving kindness, judgment, righteousness in the earth. For these things I delight, saith the Lord. But now let's finish up with our brother Paul. Back to Philippians. I've done all this. I've done this. I've done this. I've been that. I've been there. I've sat at the feet of Gamaliel, the learned rabbi. But then he concludes, I love this precious little book, Philippians. So we left off at verse 8. That I may win Christ and be found in him. Not having my own righteousness. We saw this morning in Isaiah 64 and verse 6. We are as an unclean thing. We all fade as a leaf. And our righteousnesses are filthy rags. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. But just read verse 9 again. And be found in him. It's all about God. Salvation is all about Christ. It's all from Christ. To say that baptismal regeneration saves is a lie out of hell. And yet, Emperor Constantine in the third century thought that God told him to follow the cross and he saw that supposed flaming sword in the sky with the cross and he went around with his soldiers and put swords to people's necks and said, you want to be a Christian? If, if Canada, by the way, Canada is now spelled with five letters. You can talk to me about that another time. Five letters, no longer six. If Canada says tomorrow, we are going to ordain Christianity. I ain't following that. You can't force someone to be a Christian. And Constantine, on his deathbed, waited baptism because he didn't believe in the Lord. And he wanted to be baptized before he died. Have mercy. So it's not by works of righteousness which do be done, but according to his mercy he saves us. And Paul said, be found in him, not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteous which is of God by faith. Paul said, I want to know more about him. I want to know about his life. I want to know about his talk. I want to know about his walk. And then, of course, in conclusion, what's the result of regeneration? New creature. New desires. New aspirations. How do we reach more people for Christ? How can I reach my family now that I belong to a new family, sons and daughters of the Lord? 
There is victory in Jesus now. I have victory over the world. The world is calling me and, and beckoning me. Come back, come back, come back. John puts it like this. What sort of things are born of God overcome the world? And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. We're overcomers. A changed attitude towards sin. Whosoever committeth sin transgress, sin transgresseth also the law. And sin is the transgression of the law. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for a seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he's born of God. That doesn't mean a Christian doesn't sin. First John chapter 1 will tell you. But that is the new nature can't sin. The Holy Ghost can't sin. The Holy Ghost will not lead you into sin. And when we sin, we grieve him. We quench him by not letting him control our lives. Regeneration. There's a new love for the brethren. We know that we have passed from death unto the life because they don't have any more enemies. My enemies can be my enemies, but they're not my enemies because I have a new love, a new desire, a new nature, a new name, a new fellowship. Should we stand together? Nineteen sixty three. A man was working on an automobile, and I learned John 3.3. 3. First verse I ever memorized. Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And I wish all those years from 62 before you were born. I wish I could go back and change some things, but I cannot. But there came the day in my life. There came the time in my life when I made a full divorce from the world, the flesh, and the devil. And I said, Jesus... I'm going to be for Jesus. I cut my hair. It wasn't that long, but I cut it. I began to walk with the Lord. And that's been, I don't know, 45 years now. And I thank the Lord I've had a faithful wife that has stayed and stood by my side. We don't have the perfect marriage, nor the perfect family, and this is not the perfect church. But hallelujah, I have perfect salvation. And I know where I'm going when I die. And I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded like Paul, that he is able to keep that which I committed unto him until that day. Have you ever made the commitment, my beloved? Has there ever been a white flag day in your life? When you raised the white flag of surrender and whatever it was, you said, like that old black man and the white man that went up to him and said, where do you get the pattern for those dog heads? And the old black man didn't even pick up his head. He said, I just cuts off everything that don't look like a dog. I want Jesus to cut off everything in my life that does not look like him. Your parents can't help you. Your preacher can't help you. But you have to come to the place in your life where you are ready to make a full surrender. And I thank the Lord as I look around this evening. Many of you have made that decision. And you're going on with the Lord. 
And as I looked around this evening while we were singing, I thank the Lord. Now there's a few missing tonight that because of illness at work, but I thank the Lord for each and every one of you. I don't negate those who don't come. That's up to them. And I have to love them too. And I say that sounds like you have to love them. No, I love them too. But I'm not going to browbeat them. I'm not going to push on them. I'm not going to beg them. But let's be faithful to serve him. Because I don't believe he's very far off from coming. Father, we thank you for the night. Lord, this new birth business. How I struggled with it for so long. With no assurance of my salvation until 1 John 5, 14 and 15 came before my eyes. In a booklet written by Oliver B. Green's precious wife. No so salvation. And from that day to this. I've never doubted my salvation. To be sure, there's been days that I've wondered about, am I saved or not? But a twice-born child of God can never be unsaved. But we can sometimes slip away from the truth. We can get drifting and doubting and dull of hearing as the book of Hebrew teaches us. Thank you for each precious family tonight and once again we do pray publicly out loud for Eliza. Maybe I shouldn't call out her name but I guess we can strike that as she goes off to Edmonton. A lot of things that are there to tempt her a lot of predators there. Lord, we pray your protection. Pray that she get in a proper church. Have some folks that will look out for her. And Lord, we pray that for all our church family. Help us to lift up one another daily in prayer. Help us, oh God, not to be critics, nor critical, nor judgmental. Teach us to be tender. Teach us to allow the Spirit of God all the day long to keep us in check. Help us not to quench Him, or grieve Him, or vax Him. While our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, Preacher, pray for me tonight. My walk, walk with the Lord. Pray for me tonight. God spoke to my heart. Pray for me in my walk with the Lord. Amen. You may take them down. If there's someone listening, if there's someone here tonight and you don't know Jesus, he died, shed his blood on the cross, went to the grave, rose again, Ascended at the right hand, and he's there now praying for us. And one day soon, we pray the Lord will say, that last one is saved. Now he's in the book. Go get my bride. And so, Father, if you've seen into our hearts this evening, what a privilege is mine to stand behind this sacred desk and to proclaim thy word. Help me to be faithful. Help me to be living with tenacity. And help me to keep on keeping on, and these also.